Well, greetings, everybody, and welcome to the Mold and Mildew Radio Hour. I'm Chris Davies, editor of Grower Talks and Green Profit Magazine and the e-newsletter Acres Online. And I tell you what, if you had told me uh, back in journalism school that I'd be someday hosting an hour-long webinar on mildew, I'd have said you were off your rocker. But here I am, and uh, dare I say, I'm excited because my guest today is one of the most engaging experts I've ever had the pleasure of working with. Uh, she can almost make you want to find mildew in your crops. Uh, she is the delightful and dynamic Marjorie Daughtry. Margie to her friends, and I, I like to think I'm her friend. Margie, are you there, my friend? I am here. Can you hear me? You're coming through beautifully, and I trust everyone else is. I always look in the little uh, chat area to see if anybody's saying, I can't hear, I can't hear, which uh, I'm going to address in, a, in, a, in another slide real quickly. Where are you, uh, where are you broadcasting from, Margie? Because one of the fun things about webinars is as long as you've got a computer and a microphone, you can do it from pretty much anywhere on the planet. I, I am just sitting at my desk, which is peaceful at the moment, and we'll see if it can stay that way. <laughs> Not on the beach somewhere. Of course, there's no there's no mildew on the beach. Why yeah. would you be on the beach? Uh, I, I'd like to. I would ask if there's any in your office, but that's getting a little personal. Um, normally, <laughs> actually, there's cedar apple rust in my office. It does. Oh, that's that orange fungus, isn't it? Yeah. Or not a fungus. It's a rust, right? But it's. Yeah. What is? Yeah. Well, never mind. We'll go. That's another topic. But I found it on my junipers. Looks like somebody had a jello food fight. Exactly. Um, Yes, terrible stuff. But anyway, now this is me. Normally I'd banter a bit more about the weather, but Margie, you've got, what do we count, 4,000 pictures of different mildews to share with you. Uh, so I'm going to do a little bit of light housekeeping, and then I'm going to take over. The first I'm going to do is pop up this slide, and uh, hopefully we don't need it today. But for anybody who isn't hearing us, well, it doesn't do me any good to tell them how to connect to the voice uh, integrated voice conference. So I pop this slide up for anybody who's not hearing, and usually that clears up the problem nicely. So uh, I do want to give a special thanks to our sponsor, BASF, who puts the free in free webinar. Um, if you have questions for Marjorie as you go along, uh, use uh, either the Q&A area or the chat area on the, uh, the side of your, your screen. And uh, we, will, we will address any questions pertinent to the topic at hand, if we can, um, and then everything else we'll catch at the end, if Margie has gotten through her 4,000 slides. Uh, if for some reason, if for some reason you have to uh, leave the webinar, heaven forbid, uh, it will be archived at ballpublishing.com slash webinars, the same place that you signed up. Uh, and certainly you'll want to share this one with uh, friends, colleagues, coworkers, pest control experts, etc. cetera. Um, I believe that is it, except for one little thing I'm going to do right now. I'm going to – this is something I have never done before. I'm going to turn over the control of the slideshows to my guests. Now, Margie, can I trust you not to run amok with the slide presentation? Ah, well, you've already done it. <laughs> All right. You have, con you have control of the ship. So take it away, Margie Daughtry. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Uh, with luck, I will soon get the ability to advance slides, and we can talk about mildews. And I want to talk to you today about the powdery mildews, uh, but I want to also make sure that you understand the difference between the powdery mildews and the others that sound a whole lot like them. Um, so I'd like to first of all get the downy mildews out of the way because sometimes you trip across them when you're talking about mildews or uh, growing plants in a greenhouse, and you need to know what the difference is between those two very basic kinds of diseases. So the downy mildews are not fungi. The most they can claim to be is fungus-like, and they are water mold-type organisms, uh, which like a wet, highly humid environment. Uh, officially, they're called oomycetes because they are cousins of Phytophthora and Pythium that you know of as root rot or stem rot types of organisms. And the little cartoon there is showing you what a downy mildew would look like if you magnified it a great deal. And we're looking at one of the spore structures coming out through a stomate on the underside of the leaf. Um, the downy mildews form sort of a hat rack with spores on the end uh, where the hats would be, and um, those spores are able to detach very easily when humidity goes down and blow around 
so they're able to create an epidemic very quickly because they can disseminate very easily just with air movement. You don't need to do anything special for a downy mildew to move within your green ass. My control is a bit limited, Chris, so you may have to do slides for me. There we go. So this is the same thing I was showing you in a cartoon, but shown as a photograph. Um, one of the little hat racks turned right side up for you because it seems more logical that way, even though it would normally be hanging down on the underside of a leaf. Uh, so you're looking at a conidia for and the conidia of a particular kind of downy mildew called Paranospora. And there are many plants that are susceptible to downy mildews in that particular genus. The only other thing of note that a downy mildew can do is to form this kind of a structure, which is called an oospore. And the purpose of the oospore is to allow that organism to survive winter types of conditions when there is no host available. And it becomes a um, real problem for us in the case of some of the downy mildews because it allows the organism to last in the soil between seasons and come back to attack plants in uh, subsequent years. Some of the oospores can last for more than one year. With downy mildews, you're going to see a, a variety of symptoms, including the actual sign, the, the, fun, the uh, downy mildew itself growing on the leaf producing its spores. Uh, what you might notice first would be yellow, red, or brown patches on the leaves, and those are often bounded by the veins, so they'll look like little parallelograms or squares. Uh, plants are sometimes stunted when they're affected by a downy mildew because a downy mildew is often systemic and the new growth can be stunted even if the whole plant isn't stunted. Uh, sometimes we see leaves drop off the plant when they have a downy mildew and always we will see under humid conditions the sporulation of a downy mildew on the underside of the leaf uh, and it can be white or grayish or even in the case of snapdragon a violet color. Um, the in fact, I just told you that the spoilations on the underside of the leaf is occasionally not true. Uh, once in a while, you'll see downy mildew on the upper surface of leaves as well, if the conditions are extremely, extremely humid. There are a few downy mildews that are extremely famous, and I wanted to remind Mind you of those so that you can think about how they're different from the powderies. Is your keyboard acting up, Margie? It's not. Well, let's keep trying. We might get it there yet. No. Uh, my no. keyboard is not always advancing for me. The impatience downy mildew is one of the most famous of the downy mildews, and that's caused by um, an organism, Plasmopora obducens. And you recognize it by white spore production on the underside of the leaf. And those are those little um, hat rack structures coming out through the stomates on the underside of the leaf, typical of a downy mildew. The uh, second of the famous downy mildews is coleus. Uh, since the 1980s, we've had a coleus downy mildew in this country. And it looks different to your eye in some ways, but the similarity is the sporulation is on the underside of the leaf. Um, coming out through the stomates again. Uh, the difference is that the color of the spores is different. There's pigment in these, so they look a little brownish, make the leaf look actually a little dirty. The basal downy mildew is the third of the downy mildews, and it will cause a, um, a yellow windowpane kind of look on the top of the leaf, as you see here. And then on the undersurface of the leaf, you'll have a grayish, dirty kind of an accumulation of spores because it's actually very closely related to the coleus downy mildew. Downy powdery, so what's the difference? It's all mildew. Can you lump them? Well, you really can't uh, because they are so different in nature. Um, I just mentioned the basics of a downy mildew. Um, put yourself onto a leaf surface and think of yourself as a very small ant crawling forward, and you might see these skyscrapers ahead of you. And what those are, are chains of spores of a powdery mildew. Uh, the powdery mildew is often making its spores on the top of a leaf, not on the underside. And the powdery mildew is a true fungus. So as you walk along as an ant or whatever you happen to be, that we'd be walking across the surface of a leaf, uh, you will be tripping over um, these logs that will be in your way, which are 
the fungus growing across the leaf surface uh, periodically sending down little hostoria that absorb food from the epidermal cells of the leaf. So here's our biggest difference is just that you're dealing with a fungus when you have a powdery mildew. And that means that most fungicides uh, will have a crack at a powdery mildew uh, as compared to a downy mildew, which needs very specialized uh, fungicide materials to work on it. Certainly not the same things. Um, you need some materials for one of those diseases and different materials for other diseases. Um, powdery mildew can form a second kind of spore, uh, just like the downy mildew can form a second kind of spore. Um, its spores look like little black specks on the surface of the powdery mildew that shows on the leaf. And those little black specks are not spores themselves, but they're spore cases. They're containers that hold spores within them. And um, they would be there on a fallen leaf if you were outdoors and a plant had died the previous season. In the spring, spores would be released from these little chasmothesia that would be on the fallen leaves. In the greenhouse, fortunately, we don't have to cope with these. And that's good because that's a sexual reproduction spore and it allows genetic recombination, it allows the uh, powdery mildew to change rapidly. So it's, it's just as well that we don't have to cope with them in the greenhouse. Uh, if that wasn't magnified enough for you, here's another view of a chasmothesium, the sexual spore case of a powdery mildew. Um, this is the way they look when they are fashioned by plant pathologists off at summer camp. And um, they will use things that, that are anat anatomically quite correct. For example, here the jelly beans in those little bags are representing the ascospores of the powdery mildew, all packaged up in structures called assi, which are little bags. Um, and coming out of um, what I think happens to be a moon pie in this case, but you get the idea. Um, these structures are on the surface of the leaf and they allow spore release the next spring in a natural cycle. Now, now Margie, come clean. That, those were favors at your last birthday party. <laughs> I know it. <laughs> now you just gave me a great idea for a wedding favor. Mm, great. Okay, so with a powdery mildew, you have a series of symptoms that you can see. Um, you can have white colonies. That's sort of the basic symptom for a powdery mildew. They're usually on the top of the leaf, but not always. Um, you can also see patches of discoloration in the leaves. Uh, they can be yellow or red or purple, and those constitute symptoms that might or might not indicate a powdery mildew. They should make you ask a question about whether a powdery mildew might be responsible. Um, you also can have cases when there's a thin coating of white over the entire leaf or, or petal surface or stem surface, or there might be a thick coating of white. And these are all characteristics appropriate to particular pathogens on particular hosts or under particular environmental conditions. So keep your minds open as to what a powdery mildew might look like in any given case. Um, the basic colony look is this look that you see here on the verbena leaves. You have small round spots of white. If you look closely at those, they'll often look very grainy because as the powdery mildew produces its spores in those uh, tall columns of single cells, um, it will reflect light differently and you'll get a very granular sugary kind of look to the colony. Uh, here's another example of a colony Whoops. Uh, on a poinsettia bract. And that's the nicest way to look at a powdery mildew colony. It never looks better than against that bright head, but it's heartbreaking if it happens to be your crop, of course. Margie, we have one, one question. To deviate from this. Margie, we got a quick oh, question. Go I'm not I'm not sure if it's pertinent now. Let's double check. Yeah, yeah. Scott Scott wants to know. He says, uh, since we're kind of talking symptoms, we have a lot of powdery uh, mildew on the Gerbera daisy in our greenhouses. I've seen purpling leaves, and I'm not sure if that's a symptom of the powdery too. I, he kind of thought it was nutritional. Yeah, and, and it could be either. Um, and I have a picture of some Gerber in a little bit, so we can talk about it when we get there. I haven't seen purpling on Gerber from powdery mildew, but I wouldn't put it past it. So with a microscope, you could look closely and figure that out. Um, Very and good. You could also try to rule out phosphorus deficiency and try to rule out uh, cold. Yeah, say that now he's mentioning that he thought it might be phosphorus too. So, um, hey, maybe you only have one problem instead of three. Um, when you get this kind of reddening or purpling, it's very confusing to someone who's trying to understand what's happening in the greenhouse. Uh, here's pan 
Angi, for example, you've got um, very dark purple spots uh, in the upper left-hand part of that leaf. You might see a bit of white and might believe me when I tell you that this is actually from powdery mildew. But the first time you see this disease, you're not going to recognize it unless you know that powdery mildews can play tricks. Um, under some circumstances, however, the tissue gets sort of bruised looking because it's reacting to the powdery mildew as a foreign entity. It's defending itself and you get an accumulation of pigment and you see purple instead of seeing what looks like powdery mildew. I'm losing my power to advance again, Chris. If you would help me here, that would be nice. All right. Hang on. Okay, good. So in hydrangea, you have another very likely place where you're going to see those discolorations. Um, the coloring is more of a red in cases that I've seen. On the right, you've got bract material looking very, very red and um, angry. In fact, you might consider that really decorative, uh, but those little red spots are areas where powdery mildew is attacking the bract. Most people would have no idea of that. And then over at the left on the leaf, those small spots of red are also powdery mildew. And you probably wouldn't be able to tell that unless you looked at it with a microscope to, to magnify it a bit. Um, here's another uh, scene of a hydrangea trying to fool you. This entire leaf is looking like it has fall coloration. And I would be ordinarily quite open to that being phosphorus deficiency, for example. Uh, but when I looked closely at this leaf with the microscope, I could tell that there were hyphae of the powdery mildew going across the leaf. Um, and then here you'll see the colonies doing sort of the normal thing on hydrangea. It doesn't always look purple um, during your spring production season. This is more likely what you're going to see on a Mother's Day crop are just separate colonies of white if you're not protecting against them. Sometimes you're going to see a coating on a plant. And um, Gerbera was what I had chosen to use as an example of a thin coating. This one's sort of a thick, thin coating. But you get the idea. The, the normal leaf is at the right there. That gray look is because there's a coating of the powdery mildew growing across the surface of the leaf at the left. And then sometimes you get powdery mildew forming a thick white coating, uh, here being modeled by Ina, who does a very good job of having a thick white coating. And here on a plant, you see the thick white coating on a uh, euonymus. This is uh, probably an erysiphe, which tends to grow thicker than some of the other powdery mildews to the point where you think, gee, I'm going to have to scrape the powdery mildew off my leaf to, to get down to the leaf tissue. Another one of the really impressively thick powdery mildews is seen on nine bark or physocarpus, uh, which is a terrible pity because it's a very popular plant as a native plant. Uh, but the powdery mildew will grow in the buds of this tree, and you will see this sort of systemic infection coming out in the springtime it's bright white with powdery mildew everywhere on it. It's very thick, and basically you just need to cut that off if you're trying to grow these trees. Uh, but it's um, still the same general kind of powdery mildew that we're seeing in other systems at other times. It just happens to be one that forms a very thick felt of mycelium on the leaf. And then in the flower world, I think probably one of the thickest ones that I see is the one that occurs on Phlox paniculata. Um, you can see completely coated leaves, and then if you notice, this one looks a little dirty, and that's because of the accumulation of the chasmothecia. Uh, quick question, Margie. While we're looking at things up close, Jennifer wants to know if a 20x dissecting uh, scope would be sufficient for IDing these pests. Right. I think that's a very nice question because um, just what we call a dissecting scope, a relatively low power microscope is very helpful because you just need a little help for your eyes uh, once you have observed a powdery mildew and understand that there are strands going across the surface of the leaf you can look for those and it's very helpful you'd be surprised how often people get confused about things like paint that might have dropped off the roof and think that it's powdery mildew because it is white or even more likely spray residue so um, I think even a fairly low-powered microscope or a hand lens with, with good magnification is plenty for someone who has just a little bit of experience. Uh, and another quick one here. You just mentioned on the nine bark, you mentioned the word systemic when referencing mm 
that mm -hmm. infection? Is it a true systemic or does it just look systemic? I think it's truly systemic just in those bud tissues. It's unique and we don't have to fight that in any of our greenhouse crops, fortunately. Um, downy mildews can be systemic in our world, but the powdery mildews tend to behave themselves and be uh, relatively localized. All right. And lastly, Sandy wants to know if um, uh, if it's more common on nine bark, get nine bark with red leaves than those of the more green or chartreuse varieties. Well, the answer to that is it seems like it. Okay, um, that the the red ones are the most popular, and the powdery mildew is really vivid on them, and they are highly susceptible. Uh, when the work was done comparing nine barks for their susceptibility uh, in Connecticut years back. Um, they found that the only one that wasn't highly susceptible was sort of a ungainly green plain plant that had not been hybridized or improved or selected. So if we're going to grow any of the really attractive plants, they, they have a susceptibility. Uh, whether there is truly more susceptibility in red versus um, a green, I'm not sure, uh, but I think it will seem like it to you. Any more questions, Chris, or should we move on? That, that's it for now. Okay, good. You guys are being a good audience, even though I can't see you, you're doing well. Um, so here's a list of the plants that we are concerned with in the potted plant and bedding plant industry, which are particularly prone to powdery mildew. And I know everyone who is out there in our listening audience uh, could add to this list. This is just what would fit on the slide. Uh, but I, I would like to make mention of begonias and petunias and calabrocoas and gerberas and hydrangeas and rose and rosemary and chirinia. Uh, which is pictured here, and verbena and African violet, and not regular impatience, but balsam impatience, impatience balsamina, and zinnias, all very, very prone to powdery mildew, unfortunately. And then in the herbaceous perennial world, um, I already mentioned phlox and monarda as being quite famous for, for their powdery mildew, uh, but also members of the aster family in general, uh, delphiniums, columbines, peonies, helianthus, um, both you know, composites and ranunculaceae, many of the herbaceous perennials have a, a problem with powdery mildew. We tolerate it in them to a large extent, but if you were trying to produce cosmetically perfect plants, uh, you would certainly want to shy away from the ones that are highly susceptible to powdery mildew. Okay, so let's look at some famous powdery mildews, just as we looked at some famous downy mildews. The first one is rose. Um, rose powdery mildew is famous because roses are famous and also because the powdery mildew on roses tends to go right for the part we like. Uh, it tends to go to the flower petals, it tends to go to the flower stems, and it tends to go to the younger leaves that will be closest to the flowers if you're using them as a cut flower. Um, fortunately, not every rose is highly susceptible to powdery mildew, uh, but it can be really a headache on some of the types that uh, people like to grow including some of the miniature roses that are a greenhouse crop. Um, the powdery mildew that causes the disease on roses often gets misidentified because it can even look like mealybugs, as in this picture, just really thick globs of, of white up towards the, the buds on the plant. Uh, you can have very nice, tidy, classic colony appearances on roses initially, as in this image. But there can also be that uh, thinner, thick coating kind of routine that appears on some of the more susceptible varieties. It seems like as people get away from varieties that are, are prone to black spots, sometimes they, they fall into the pit of having chosen a variety that's a little bit prone to powdery mildew. Um, so from a gardener's perspective, you want to try to choose a rose that doesn't have either of those problems to a great extent. One of the other looks of powdery mildew on rose is this look of them being somewhat uh, frosty. So you have um, a really thick growth of the, the mycelium across the surface of the leaf and also a lot of sporulation going on. And what this leads to is um, the possibility for a great deal of resistance to fungicides when you're trying to manage a powdery mildew. When there's all this sporulation, that large population has a lot of resilience in it, genetically speaking. And if you continue to hammer a powdery mildew with the same active ingredient over and over and over again, uh, the powdery mildew will often just respond by becoming resistant. So we always 
need to think of powdery mildew as being one of the diseases where you have to be especially careful to do rotation as you're setting up your, your program for managing the disease chemically. And incidentally, while I'm alluding back to the downy mildews, they're also in that category. They also produce prolific sporulation and they need to be looked at this way uh, with a really careful attention to resistance management. And the third one would be botrytis. And I think all of you who are out in the real world understand that those are three diseases that um, can reach epidemic proportions quickly if you're not doing a good management program. Um, this, of course, is, is somewhat the, the ultimate of what you can have in a poinsettia crop. Um, nice separated little colonies here, not a thick mass, but boy, that certainly does destroy the quality of poinsettias when this pseudoidium poinsettiae appears. Um, this is a disease that was not bothering our industry until 1988. There are a number of different kinds of powdery mildew that have been reported to uh, occur on poinsettias in various parts of the globe. Um, over the years, but this is the one that has been in our industry since the late 80s and fortunately isn't showing up all that often. Um, that doesn't mean we can quit looking for it. Uh, growers who don't have scouting could get an ugly surprise in any given year. So uh, particularly if you have many poinsettias, make sure you have someone who's scouting carefully for them. Uh, the look in the summertime is quite different from what I just showed you. Um, the leaf at the left here has sort of a yellow modeling to it, and it really is only when you turn the leaf over that you see something that looks like powdery mildew colonies, and that's because this fungus that causes the powdery mildew on poinsettia is very sensitive to high temperature, and it's seeking the cooler niche on the undersurface of the leaf. So finding it early, which is when you want to find it so that you can make good plans for control, it really requires being inquisitive. If you see a yellow spot, turn your poinsettia leaves over and check to see if you might have a powdery mildew. There's a quick question there about uh, this photo. Margie, do you see it? Uh, good preventive measures for powdery mildew? No, this photo of the poinsettia has the webby spots. I was wondering uh, if it ever appeared in downy mildew or specific to powdery mildew. Oh, okay. Uh, the webby look is um, very much a powdery mildew thing. And I, I often explain it to people by telling them it looks like a fungus growing on a Petri plate. If you've ever had that experience, you can see the, the fungus radiating out in all directions. So the, the word webby or um, a sense of it really radiating out is, is very typical for powdery mildew as opposed to downy mildew. Very good. And a lot of folks asking specific control or product questions. We'll get to those later on. There'll be a whole section on how to control this stuff. You're not right. just going to leave us hanging with a bunch of mildew and no way to get rid of it, are you, Margie? No, I'll try not. Okay. okay. Uh, Thank we'll, you. We'll keep going. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> forward, we'll move. So um, just a specific on the poinsettia mildew is that um, it has a, it's very much ruled by temperature. Uh, so that we have learned through Mary Hausbeck's research at Michigan State that the magic temperature for the poinsettia mildew is 86 degrees Fahrenheit. And I wouldn't say that this is true for the other mildews. They all have their own personalities. But it's helpful to know that you're going to see um, powdery mildew appearing on the upper surface of leaves and really moving into an epidemic phase once you get cooler conditions in the greenhouse. That used to be sometime around Columbus Day, but boy, the weather's wacky enough that I wouldn't try to predict anymore. Um, here you can see just a close up of one of those little conidia cores on the right um, that is the particular powdery mildew that goes after the poinsettias. It has this cute little kink at the base of its conidia core. It's very distinctive. Um, but unfortunately, it thinks of bracts the same way it thinks of leaves. So if you have a problem in a crop, you want to control it while it's in that foliar phase and not have surprises when you have bracts. Um, another one of the famous powdery mildews would be rosemary powdery mildew. Uh, I had a question on it just before this uh, webinar started that I haven't had a chance to answer yet. I know what's happening out there right now. Um, rosemary powdery mildew used to be something that master gardeners tended to ask me about because they would see it on plants that, we, that they would bring indoors in the wintertime. Uh, but now we grow a lot of rosemary in greenhouses and I'm finding it to be a real production problem. One of the difficulties with it is that the whitening on the surface of the leaf is not always very obvious. It can just be on a few leaves at first 
And again, that's when you want to find it. If you're scouting your rosemary and watching for the beginnings of powdery mildew, you can avoid having an ugly surprise where there's a lot that you want to erase. Because the control options are limited for an edible crop, uh, you're going to learn how to manage powdery mildew with things like potassium bicarbonate or the biological control organisms, whether they be fungi or, or bacteria, or with oil materials that are legal to use on food crops. All of those will work against powdery mildew because the lucky thing is that powdery mildew is very exposed. Its tendency to grow across the surface of the plant and just put in little suckers into the, the um, outer level layer of cells means that you can get good contact with it. You can't necessarily eradicate it, but you can do a pretty darn good job of pushing it back. And you can certainly keep a clean plant clean if you have a good control program. Uh, Phlox is one of the other stellar kinds of powdery mildew plants. This would be the poster child, I think, if powdery mildew had a poster child. And with Phlox, we know that some of the cultivars do better than others for us. Um, you can have uh, Phlox David, for example, which is one of the perennial plants of the year from the past, uh, doing so much better than many of the other white flowered cultivars. Uh, we've also seen a uh, nice reduction in powdery mildew uh, with things like Orange Perfection and Prime Minister and Starfire and Blue Boy, and Miss Ellie and Miss Universe, Laura and Nikki. But I wanted to point out to everyone, and this is something you might want to come back for, um, there is some very good information online that is um, at the Chicago Botanic Garden. Richard Hawkey has developed very good information lists over years of how the uh, flocks performed with regard to diseases, including powdery mildew. And then here's a, a, an example showing you White Admiral on the left versus David at the right. White Admiral isn't the worst of, um, of flocks for powdery mildew. I used to use Mount Fuji if I wanted a plant to be solidly white. Uh, but David certainly does well. And then the next slide will also show us a contrast in one of my friend's gardens, uh, David on the left, and then just another little seedling that volunteered itself looking very mildew ridden. Uh, there's a, a real difference if you work with the less susceptible cultivars. And Monarda, the same kind of thing. You can have a great deal of infection on the upper surface of the, the leaves of Monarda. And, um, and there will also be colonies that will show on the undersurface of the leaves because it has to find somewhere to go, I think. After it takes the top, it will go after the bottom. Uh, again, there is information that Richard Hawkey has produced um, on the relative resistance of Monarda to powdery mildew, and that's a useful website to go to. And in our experience, we've been relatively happy with uh, Jacob Klein and Violet Queen and Fishes and Snow White. Not that they don't get mildew, but the kind of thing that I'm usually looking for is um, a plant where your eye is drawn to the flower rather than drawn to the white of the powdery mildew. We can accept some of it. We don't have to eradicate powdery mildew, but we like cultivars that, that are attractive in their, their appearance that allow you to look at the flowers. Powdery mildew verbena is another one of the diseases that has been extremely important, but I would like to congratulate the industry. I think uh, the greenhouse industry has done a very good job of getting rid of a lot of the susceptible cultivars. Verbenas generally are doing so much better than they were 20 years ago. So to see a plant that's as white as the one in this picture is pretty unusual. Uh, the powdery mildew in this case is Podosphera xanthii. Uh, it can form individual colonies, as you see in, in this picture of Anchases and it can also do a coating on the foliage. And I think this was a really bad problem for growers for many years because it tended to affect a plant that we were growing and hanging baskets. And a lot of the activity was in a plant that was already up in the air so that you couldn't see it clearly, and it was affecting the lower foliage of the plant. That was definitely where we would see most of the action with this. And it would lead to dead leaves which were often misdiagnosed as a spider mite problem, for example. Uh, um, we did a number of um, comparisons of cultivars to look at um, how susceptible they were to this photosphera, and we found a huge range. 
and uh, the exact details of which one scored well and which one didn't score well really aren't important here, but the generalization was that within a series, we could see a lot of variation in the performance between different colors. Uh, they were not all similar in their susceptibility to the powdery mildew. And it was also very good news to see that there were some that were really totally non-susceptible to the race that we were using for our test. So I think that's what has worked for us now is that the industry has selected away from the highly susceptible verbenas and given us ones that are much easier to grow. Uh, but we don't produce flowers in a vacuum. We're also concerned with other things in the environment, um, including vegetable crops sometimes are relevant. Uh, powdery mildew does occur on pumpkins and lo and behold, it's the same exact powdery mildew that affects our verbenas and some of the other flower crops that we grow. Uh, here's a close-up of Podospira xanthii on a squash in the greenhouse. Um, pardon me for having slides going in both directions at once. I think um, I've gotten ahead of you, Margie, What's, or behind you. <laughs> okay, well, uh, one or the we're, other. We're looking at, we're looking at the uh, racks of pumpkins now. Okay, go one yep. forward. There we go. Pim, I'm coming. And back. there we are. One more forward. Okay, that's where I am. Good. Um, so, thank you very much. The same powdery mildew fungus is going after um, both pumpkins and verbenas. And it can also get a couple of the other flower crops that we grow, like Bidens is no longer a weed. It's also a flower crop. Uh, calendulas, uh, terrenias, and petunias can all get the same powdery mildew. Um, this one's a little unusual in that it goes across different families, and it helps to know what things are sharing the same powdery mildew so that you don't keep verbena plants over winter and then try to start up a Mother's Day crop of zucchini in the same greenhouse. Um, petunias can also get this very same powdery mildew, the, the um, xanthii, Podosphera xanthii, and you might notice that they have the disease by noticing some yellowing on the foliage of lower leaves on the plant, and uh, only when you look closely with a hand lens or a low-powered microscope are you going to notice that there is a coating of fairly thin uh, powdery mildew that is leading to then the, the chlorotic look that you see at the right here. A lot of times we've seen powdery mildew in the past just on petunias at the end of the fall season, outdoors in gardens, but uh, it can actually occur on petunias that are in, grown in the greenhouse. It's fairly rare to see, and it's not, this Podosphera xanthii isn't the only powdery mildew they can get, but it's a possibility. So if you think you're seeing it, double check, don't just think you're crazy. Um, in most, in more recent years, We've been seeing a powdery mildew problem brewing on Calabrocoa, and this is a crop that we thought was free from powdery mildew originally. Uh, if you could go one further forward, Chris, I think, there we go. Um, this disease has recently been reported from uh, Nicaragua and Germany, as well as here in the United States, and it's um, going to have a lot of the same attributes as the verbena and the petunia disease in that it's going to tend to cause some yellowing on lower leaves and it's going to tend to get misdiagnosed because it's not very white. Um, so keep your eyes open for this. It's not happening to all the Calabrocoa cultivars. And again, I think it will be as with the verbena. I think the industry will weed out those troublesome cultivars um, and will be left with the ones that don't have a powdery mildew problem. Uh, here you can see up close um, this is the, the Calabrocoa disease, looking sort of like someone shook a little talcum powder over the foliage, uh, just sort of resting in the hairs there. Um, incidentally, and I'm just remembering that you will see that thrips interact a little bit with powdery mildew. I think they like to use it to, to um, get some moisture when they're walking across a dry leaf. Um, so I suspect them of moving it around when they're moving around the greenhouse too. Um, so just get rid of your powdery mildew so you're not feeding your thrips. Uh, powdery mildew does not just attack leaves. Here's an illustration of how it can attack the stems of Calabrocoa, and I've also seen that on petunias and on verbenas. Um, it's not the first place where it will show up necessarily, but it's one of the possibilities. Uh, one rule of thumb is to expect the unexpected with powdery mildew. And one of the unexpected things we saw last year because there was a um, plant that was 
showing sort of ugly flowers in, in one of the greenhouses here on Long Island. And looking closely, we realized that the flowers that were ugly were ugly because they had powdery mildew colonies on the petals. And uh, that's not something anyone would expect. There wasn't blatant powdery mildew on the foliage, but apparently there are some cultivars where uh, sort of with the, uh, sort of like the rose powdery mildew, the preference is for petal tissue. So again, this would be a good kind of um, behavior pattern to get out of the industry so that we don't have to worry about the petals on a plant. It's always the hardest place to control the disease with fungicides. It's always much easier to get control uh, while you have plants in their vegetative state. Um, a little bit more possibility for surprise came when we became aware of pansies having a powdery mildew. Um, it could look very classic like this and perfectly normal, but under other circumstances, we get more of that bruised look that I show you, showed you earlier. Um, here on the lower image, you can see powdery mildew growing across the surface of the leaf uh, and then putting up its little uprights of spores. Uh, if you can see something like this, you can make a diagnosis, even if that tissue is discolored and it has you all confused. And full disclosure, Marjorie, the frog was innocent in spreading the powdery mildew, right? <laughs> I suspect it was more than innocent, yes. All right, and here's your purplish look, which is sort of mingled with some white. So hopefully you would all understand that that was a powdery mildew. And um, the, the purple would actually help draw your eye to the situation and, and allow you to realize what was going on. The main place where pansy growers have trouble with this is actually when they're trying to grow pansy flowers. Uh, for uses in salads or as some sort of edible decoration. Uh, when you have a crop of pans year round, you have a big powdery mildew problem sometimes. Uh, here's another case where you can get just really fooled. Um, Gerbera usually will show quite a lot of powdery mildew on the foliage, but it's not impossible to run into this kind of a symptom and not realize it's part of the powdery mildew. Those brown oval lesions there on these petals are due to powdery mildew, and the response of the petals is to create a, um, a dead brown area. So um, sometimes it's going to be perfectly obvious, and other times you're going to be fooled for a long time and think that you have a, another flower spotting fungus going on at the same time as your powdery mildew. Uh, another fooling plant can sometimes be a calancho. Powdery mildew can look a little bit whitish on them, but it often tends to make scabby spots on the upper surface of the leaf or, or the undersurface of the leaf. And um, different species of calancho can show this kind of syndrome when powdery mildew goes after them. And we've even seen powdery mildew on jade plant. Not a normal event, but um, powdery mildew is not one fungus, it's many fungi with um, their preference for particular kinds of plants. So I've, I've pretty much gotten so I can't be surprised anymore. Even if I have a plant that I think never gets powdery mildew, often I will see one eventually if I'm just patient. Uh, sedum is an example of uh, one that's very often not understood at all. It doesn't look white on, on sedums in the least. Powdery mildew can form sort of greasy spots or scabby spots, and it can be very obvious on the underside, as you see here, uh, and associated with some yellowing. And you could easily be using a fungicide that was good for leaf spots and not good for powdery mildew if you were looking at these kinds of symptoms. And then um, you can have two things at once. I just thought I would make this mention. Here's your uh, image of Monarda from before. The um, powdery mildew is obvious here on the underside of the leaf, but there are also these little orange spots. Those are a rust fungus. So just because you have found one disease, still keep your eyes open. Sometimes there's a second one there at the same time. The lucky thing in this case is that the fungicides that work well against powdery mildews are quite often the exact same ones that work well against rust. So probably one chemical program would serve both purposes for you. So um, another caveat here is to just beware that uh, sometimes powdery mildew is going to show up where you might expect it, but not look normal. And um, a normal look for some of the begonias is to be quite covered with powdery mildew, and it's easy to identify because it's quite white, but it doesn't always look like that on begonia. Uh, 
So if you compare in the next image here, we've got a Rex begonia showing what um, looks more like a little greasy spots. Um, and those spots are powdery mildew, and you'd have to look pretty closely between all the excitement of the, the foliage pattern and the uh, fact that the powdery mildew is just in a different mood on this plant. It might be quite hard to identify, but this could be inoculum for other begonias that um, you value. So keep an eye on, on all kinds of a plant within the greenhouse to watch for the beginnings of powdery mildew epidemics. Um, the top of the leaf is where we expect to see powdery mildew, but that's not always where it's going to be. Um, one example is on Vinca. We have seen this look of um, nutritional deficiency between the veins, and that nutritional deficiency look is not nutritional deficiency of itself. It's a nutritional deficiency caused by the parasite, the powdery mildew, that in this case is growing on the undersurface because it's a unique kind of powdery mildew that grows out from the undersurface of the leaf and produces its spores to the outside. Um, the name of this powdery mildew is Lavellula taurica, and we don't talk about it much because we don't see it much, but it appears occasionally, and I've seen it a couple of times in Vinca in particular. Um, you can see symptoms of yellowing or browning on the top of the leaf, and if you were very curious and turn the leaf over and look very closely, you might be able to figure out that it's a powdery mildew problem. Uh, some researchers in Brazil a few years ago realized that they were seeing a number of instances of this libellula on some of their flower crops on things like lisianthus and callas and nasturtiums um, and on milkweeds and, and balsam and patients. So they were finding it across many different kinds of hosts, which is one of the worst things that a powdery mildew can do. You end up having to manage it here and there instead of just on one host. And more recently, nasturtiums have shown up with this disease in Florida. So we, we know that it's going to be an occasional problem coming into our industry and we have to keep our eyes open to it and realize that not every spot is just a fungus leaf spot uh, of another type and not every spot is indicating mite feeding, which is what I would probably guess at looking at this nasturtium shown in this illustration. So when you go to managing powdery mildew, uh, you're going to want to keep the humidity down in the greenhouse, certainly under 85%, because all powdery mildews profit from high humidity rather than a wet leaf surface. Um, you're going to want to pay a lot of attention to cultivars so that you can sidestep the problem by growing better cultivars the next year if you fall into a bad powdery mildew problem. Uh, do a lot of scouting of the crops you know are prone to it. Check the underside of leaves as well as the top of the leaf when you're looking for powdery mildew. And if you do find some powdery mildew through your scouting program, um, use the right fungicides and use them in rotation if you find the, the disease is present. Um, you can work with biofungicides against powdery mildew. They do actually very well against powdery mildew. Um, they're not going to give the same level of control that you'll get with the chemical materials because those are so highly evolved to be really effective, but you will be able to reduce disease significantly. So if you're on top of the problem, you can have a very effective program with those. Uh, things like the Actinovate or Cease or Triathlon BA are, are all helpful against powdery mildews. Um, the fungicide groups that are relevant for powdery mildew management are shown here. Um, I hope you all understand the concept of FRAC groups. These are groups that help you understand the differences in mode of action for various fungicides. And when you go to do a rotation, you're always uh, supposed to make sure that you're not rotating within a group. Um, so, for example, group 11 at the top there, the strobilurins, include some fungicides that are extremely good against powdery mildew, uh, such as compass and pageant, um, but you can't rotate between compass and pageant. That's not accomplishing anything. Uh, even though they're two different fungicides, they're within that same group 11. And likewise, you wouldn't want to rotate between um, those group 11 materials and the group 11 plus three materials, such as Trigo or Fame plus T, uh, that are mentioned just a little lower down there. Uh, because you're essentially repeating that group 11 um, to no effect. So pay attention to the frac groups as you're developing your powdery mildew program. Um, the strobilurins I mentioned as being particularly powerful, 
Uh, the DMI materials are also very effective against powdery mildew. Um, and then there are others that are also extremely helpful as you go through. Um, the bottom group is showing you materials written in blue, which are um, softer chemistry, biological controls, or um, things that are considered biological by EPA. And um, you can have a very good management program working with those, uh, particularly integrating things such as uh, alternating a bicarbonate material such as millstop or armor carb or caligreen uh, with an oil material with a biological. That, that integration is really very helpful to having a strong program. So as you can see, there's a long list of possibilities. Uh, there's more than actually fit on this slide. So you have many tools. You mostly just need to make sure you're starting your program early enough to have an effective program without a lot of powdery mildew left staring you in the face. Um, you can always prevent more easily than you can eradicate with a disease such as this. Um, of these materials, the only one that helps it be less visible is the, the, um, the oil materials. They soak into the mycelium on the surface of the leaf and make the powdery mildew a little less visible. And I just uh, wanted to put this up while we're talking. Um, if any of you are interested in a more thorough listing of the materials that are available for use against powdery mildew or any of the other diseases, Cornell does have a guidebook that they sell that's available online as an online copy or as a hard copy um, that you might be interested in. Uh, we do this every year and we, we forget to tell people about it, so I thought it would be useful to mention it to this group. And then I have just one more slide that we can contemplate as a, a leaf with powdery mildew. Um, and we can take more questions, I think, because even though I had 14,555 slides, Chris, I did actually get through them. You did a beautiful, beautiful job uh, leaving time for questions, which we do have a few. Let me uh, skim back up to see what we answered and what we didn't. Uh, let's see. We covered the nine bark things. And the, uh, well, how about weather? You touched on it a bit. You touched on humidity. Talk about mm -hmm. uh, weather conditions which favor downy mildew or powdery mildew. Uh, and can weather conditions help you differentiate which one you have? Saul wants to know that. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, one of the things I think of is sort of a, a weather at certain times of year varies, of course. Um, downy mildew is in the, the out of the greenhouse world very much a spring and fall problem because it likes cooler temperatures with high humidity. So there's a time of year when you get those cooler temperatures with high humidity. So that's the, the main time for downy mildews in, in general. Um, and I think you've all seen downy mildews happening in the summer too. So when we do a lot of overhead irrigation, we create microclimates that sometimes favor downy mildew. In a shady overhead irrigated plot, you have pretty much the same situation as, as spring. Uh, with powdery mildew, um, there is a huge connection to weather um, with the midsummer period being the main time for outdoor outbreaks of powdery mildew because you get um, thin films of moisture forming on the leaf, known as, as dew, um, that will start occurring midsummer when you have a big variation between the night temperature and the day temperature. And powdery mildew does not thrive in outdoors in spring conditions because it's often quite rainy and there's more wetness than it needs. And there's some fungi that control the powdery mildew under wet conditions. Um, in the greenhouse, I think um, we control the weather to a large extent. So um, with each crop, there is a time when a particular powdery mildew is likely to show up. Um, and the easiest, clearest example is the, the poinsettia where you will probably not be able to notice it in the spring or the summer if you have poinsettias on your property, but it's only in the fall that it's going to get really obvious to you because it's cooler and the conditions are right uh, for that particular powdery mildew, which doesn't have a high requirement for humidity. Um, that's an individual trait of that mildew. It, it needs the cooler temperatures and it does amazingly well indoors as well as in greenhouses. It has a, a wide humidity range. Uh, you spent a bit of time on nine bark, Margie. Uh, Jennifer wants to know about if there's a systemic out there, maybe uh, tebuconazole uh, for, for nine bark. Well, um, tebuconazole is an example of one of the systemic fungicides that works really well. Um, we 
don't have um, as many usages of it on Long Island as people do in other parts of the country, but I have trialed it and think of it as a, a particularly good powdery mildew fungicide. So that one used in alternation with another one, which was not a DMI, uh, would be a good concept for, for working against that particular disease. And um, perhaps timing in the fall would also be smart because you could perhaps do something to prevent that bud colonization that happens, no doubt, in the fall period. Um, I don't know which of those things are labeled for use on nine bark. You'll have to check that as well. It's always important to double check and make sure that you're being legal with your pesticide applications. All right. Valerie is wondering about sulfur bombs. The, the sulfur bomb question. That's a traditional way to uh, control it, right? Yeah. Sulfur is very effective against powdery mildew, but there's um, a real question about the legality of a sulfur bomb because they're not cleanly labeled for pesticide usage in greenhouses. So the, the ability to use that would probably vary from state to state in terms of how they interpret what is the legal pesticide application. Um, there are legal uses of sulfur as a spray, um, such as a microthiol kind of a spray. Um, the, the danger there is that when you get high temperatures in the greenhouse, uh, sulfur can turn into sulfuric acid and burn plants. So you need to obey all the restrictions on the labeling telling you to make sure the temperatures are below a particular level, like below 85 um, Fahrenheit, to, to avoid injury from a sulfur application. All right, all right. Jim, 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 Okay, Chris, I could not understand you. You might want to type that one to me. Assuming my voice is clear. Are you not hearing me now? Check me, check me, one, two. Hi, Margie, hi, Margie. Oh, oh. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, Brian Corsa, that sounds like a lion's rice ratchet. Yeah, Brian, 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 we may have lost our good waves for continuing this webinar, but it came at a good time if it had to happen. Okay, so I'm going to see if I can just finish at our time here. We've got just a few minutes. I think the audience can hear me. I'm going to keep proceeding on the assumption that I sound okay to you um, and look through here to questions to see if there's another one that uh, would be of use to the audience. Um, I'm seeing something about using a citric acid-based fungicide and alternating it with an oil-based fungicide and would that work as a mode of action rotation? And I've, I've not worked with a citric acid material at all, so I don't have much um, experience with that. But um, I can tell you that when you're using those kinds of materials that were down at the bottom of my list uh, that were in a different color, um, those are not subject to resistance. That's why they don't have a frac number. Um, if you're working with something like an oil, it is doing so many different things to be toxic to the mildew that it is extremely um, less likely to cause a resistance to itself uh, when it's used. So there is less necessity of rotating um, a biological, a bicarbonate, and an oil. The only reason to rotate there is not for resistance management, it's just for efficacy. And sometimes it is quite nice to use different modes of action in those uh, contact materials just purely to get good efficacy. Am I coming through yet, Margie? Uh, you sound so much better now. You have no idea. Oh. Uh, someone's asking to see the chart that lists all the um, frac materials, which is about three back. If you could take them back to that. That's what you want, I think. That's probably good for them to sit with because there's a lot of information on there. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, we need to wrap up. So here's the thing I'm going to tell you. This webinar is going to be archived. My garbled duck-like voice and all there at the end. We'll get to the bottom of why that happened. I have no idea. Um, 
but we, we need to, to kind of finish up some housekeeping here. If you have more questions, if yours weren't answered, uh, maybe even for a copy of that chart, uh, you can email Marjorie directly. There's her email address, mld9 at cornell.edu. Uh, you're uh, standing by 24-7, right, Marjorie? Absolutely, anytime. <laughs> and she really means that. She really is. Uh, this webinar, as I said, it'll be archived as soon as we can manage. Uh, same place you signed up, so you can watch it again. You can get the details, scroll ahead, you know, to, to, to get what you need, share it with friends, et cetera. Quick commercial. I've got more of these coming up. We're going to be doing an, an LED lighting webinar Wednesday, June Seventh, uh, really getting into the, the nuts and bolts of, of growing. This will be all real world greenhouse experiences. And this is an exciting one. Uh, Armitage Unchained. Thursday, June 22nd is the tentative date. Neither of these, we, you can't register for them yet, but note them in your calendar and be prepared. This should be crazy. You thought Margie was wild. <laughs> but, uh, and one last thanks to our, uh, our sponsor, BASF. Thank you guys so much for making this possible. And uh, with that, Margie, I want to say thank you so much for this great webinar. Um, you and all your mildew friends are great. We're going to have, to, we have to have you back again and dig into this, do some more diseases maybe. So, so thanks very much. Uh, and thanks to all my folks at, uh, at Ball Publishing who really have no love for mildew. But, you know, <laughs> there's no accounting for taste. Uh, but with that, this is Chris Babies saying so long, everybody. Thank you.